So um, yeah, thanks for the introduction. Um, uh, like you said, I am a uh, physics graduate student at the uh, University of California, Berkeley. I work in the Ramesh lab um, and uh, I work with a bunch of other folks uh, who I should mention just because uh, you got to give credit where credit's due. So all these people here, uh, the Department of Physics, Material Science, um, also Intel Corporation, and also the Electrical Engineering Computer Science Department at Berkeley. This has been kind of a, a piece of work between all, uh, a big collaboration with all of those folks. Um, and so today I'm just going to talk a little bit about how I use the, the, the 765 model from Berkeley Nucleonics and specifically pertaining to a paper um, that I just, uh, that we just published um, call uh, as, it, as it pertains to ferroelectric switching. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the physics um, that we're trying to address or investigate, but um, I will also highlight, you know, why the, the 765 was so important. Uh, will it switch screens is the question. There we go. OK, so ferroelectricity, I, like I said, I have to give a, a brief introduction into what the actual physics we are studying is. Um, so what is ferroelectricity? Uh, so it's 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 actually a really cool thing. What it is is that if I have, uh, can you see my cursor? I, I don't know. I should, I, we sure can. Okay, great. So um, what you have is on the left here is this crystal structure. This is a cubic crystal structure, and if in some in some class of materials, which are called ferroelectrics, if you cool down the uh, the temperature of the material, you actually get a phase transition, and you uh, get a distortion in the in the crystal structure, as shown here. And what that means is that uh, the ions that make up the, the crystal are displaced relative to one another, and you actually get a built-in uh, electric polarization. So as you cool it down, you get the emergence of this P vector, which means that I have an actual electric um, polarization built into the material. So this is, this is interesting for a number of reasons. You know, fundamentally, like just from fundamental physics, it's interesting that this occurs. Um, but uh, the reason that folks like Intel or um, people like that, computer science, is, is interested in this is because uh, they think that we will be able to build logic devices basically using these this class of materials. So if you want to do that, um, the reason you can do that is because you can think about this polarization as being basically a state variable. So uh, you could imagine the polarization pointing up, as I've drawn here, that could be a one, and the, the polarization pointing down, that could be a zero. Right, so you can actually build kind of logic devices out of this. Uh, so fair, that's what a ferroelectric is, and how you manipulate a ferroelectric is by applying an, an electric field. So um, it's kind of, that's what I'm showing here in A and B on the right, is the as you apply an electric field, so as you apply a voltage to the material, you actually can switch the polarization from up to down. And the way you pick up the, the, the switching event is that as I apply some voltage, you can actually, and, and as the ferroelectric begins to switch, you pick up a current um, as a displacement current of the, of the actual polarization switching. So um, here in A, I'm showing basically as I apply some voltage, I can get a, uh, a current out. And in B, I'm showing that there's this kind of hysteresis behavior. And what I mean by that is, let's say I start um, in the up state here. And now I apply some negative voltage. I can actually switch my polarization. So the y-axis here is polarization. I'm actually switching my polarization uh, to the negative state. And if I turn off my voltage, I come back here and my polarization stays in the negative state, right? So in that way, I'm kind of, it's a remnant non-volatile um, uh, state. So as after I've switched it, it stays there, right? And that non-volatility and that switching process is kind of the, the key for uh, building um, uh, a logic device. Okay, so the thing that I'm particularly interested in, so we're kind of narrowing down here, right? That was the, the broad overview. Now we're narrowing down to what I'm actually looking at. So what I want to look at is I want to look at the process by which the, the, the ferroelectricity, by which the polarization switches from one state to the other. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply some electric field in the form of voltage pulse, and I'm going to watch uh, the current that comes out of the material to understand how does that switching process actually occur? So the this is the type of experiment I'm doing here, and, I'll, and I have a little animation that I think will explain things a little bit. So the red balls are um, synced together. So let's just say that I have, I'm gonna basically trace out this hysteresis loop. So what I'll do is I'll apply some negative voltage, and that will 
preset my polarization in a well-defined state. So by applying that negative voltage, I preset my polarization to the negative state. Now I apply a sequence of two up pulses. The first up pulse will switch the polarization. Um, I'll let it relax to what I called the remnant state, if you remember. Um, and, then I'll, and then I'll drive it again with an identical up pulse, which will not switch the polarization, but will enable me to look at how the, uh, how the material responds when there is no switch, right? So the key here is that in the first up pulse, switching response plus some other kind of dielectric or uh, just other, other types of material responses. And in the second pulse, I only have the material or the, the, the non-switching response. So what I can do is I can subtract the, uh, you know, the response to the first pulse minus the response to the second pulse, and that gives me just the switching response. Okay. So what you can do is you can do this. Um, uh, this, is, this is what it actually looks like. So uh, this is kind of in, in B here, I'm showing what it looks like for that, uh, this black line shows the switching response plus the non-switching response. And this kind of gray line, which is a little bit hidden, that shows you the uh, only the non-switching response. And so what you can do is you can subtract um, the two, and then you get something like in C, and that's that's purely switching. All right, so that's that's what we're trying to get at. We're trying to understand what is the process by which the polarization goes from up to down, and we do it by looking at the sequence of three pulses. One presets the polarization in a well-defined state. The second switches and measures the rest of the circuit, basically. And the second one measures only what's happening in the circuit, not the switching. And so by subtracting the two, you can get, get just the switching. Okay, so this, this data I'm showing here on the bottom is actually from a different paper. And I want to highlight that the time scale is relatively long, um, uh, as, uh, especially uh, with what I'm going to show you guys in a minute here. So this is in the microseconds. Um, but there has been some work done which uh, used a, a kind of complex uh, device structure. So I'm going to talk about what this is. So one of the reasons that, um, the, that this was such a long time scale is because the, uh, the stimulus is relatively slow. So what I mean by that is if I'm applying, you know, just some pulse generator and, I, and I'm capable of, let's say, you know, um, let's say 100 nanosecond um, rise times, then nothing is going to happen faster than 100 nanoseconds because that's the rate at which the stimulus is being applied. So one way to get around this is to do something pretty intense and uh, it takes a lot of uh, microfabrication steps. And this is a little bit complex, but all they do here is this is basically just a pulse generator. Um, but the way that they do the pulse generator is they use a, a laser pulse in order to create a very short rise time, um, um, uh, a very short rise time uh, pulse. So uh, by biasing kind of this, uh, you know, I can bias across these two contacts and then I can shine a, a short laser pulse as shown here. And what that does is it kind of uh, photo excites carriers, meaning that I can get a very short lifetime of, of, of uh, voltage pulse that comes down the, down, the, down the pulse generator. So you can do this, but it's a lot of fab steps. And each time that you want to do one switching experiment, you would need to make an entire device like this, which is very involved um, and not something that that uh, that we wanted to do because we want to be testing a lot of different devices of different geometries and um, uh, different materials, et cetera, et cetera. So we don't want to have to be going through the step of making this kind of uh, laser uh, uh, pulse generator every single time. So the reason I show this is because they showed some very interesting data um, using one of these uh, these laser pulse generators. And what they found was that you can get switching. So this is the same exact experiment I ex ex explained before, where you subtract the switching minus the non-switching response. And they found that you can get switching of your ferroelectric polarization in the kind of hundreds of picoseconds. Okay, so that was much faster from that microsecond uh, time regime that I showed you earlier. And the question is, is this... Um, is this kind of ubiquitous across different uh, to, to all ferroelectrics, or is it was it just a kind of a something that happened in this experiment only? And so, what we wanted to do is we wanted to answer that question. We want to say, all right, can we see things happen at, at this kind of time scale? Um, but we don't want to have to go through all those fabrication steps, and that's kind of where the 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 seven six five comes in, right? So something that's relatively, um, but uh, 
and can get us like you know honestly relatively close to these kinds of timescales, but doesn't have to be um, uh, all of this fabrication and you know kind of time intensive uh, work. So what did I do? There's a lot on the screen. Um, uh, this is for, directly from my paper. So what I do is I actually use this, this pulse generator here is the 765. And I basically just use, um, uh, I, I run the voltage pulse into, into my material. So that's right, I think I showed you earlier, you have a top electrode, a bottom electrode, and you have the material. And that's exactly what I have here. And I just use the 765 to generate my um, voltage pulses. And what I find is I can get switching in the tens of nanoseconds. That's since here. And this is kind of this is kind of uh, we're we're starting to scratch the surface of of we're we're approaching those much faster time scales. So now we're two orders of magnitude faster than that one microsecond sort of time scale. And what's really interesting about um, uh, yeah what it, what's yeah so. What's really interesting is that this, without the 765, we would have never been able to reach these time scales, right? So I used it in order to apply the stimulus in order to look at the switching event and was able to actually um, uh, kind of get to the fastest time scales observed in this particular material, this, this LBFO here. But more importantly, it was, you know, I can now take what I've built and I can go to a very simple fabrication process and I can test a whole plethora of samples much faster than this kind of um, fabrication process. So um, right, the keys to the, the 765 were, you know, this really fast rise time. That's the thing that I really cared about the most um, because that, that basically defines what's the, the speed limit of my stimulus. You know, it's computer programmable. This, these, uh, the, the switchable polarity, this allows me to to do my pulse profile where I have a preset pulse and then two up pulses. It's very reliable, you know, everything, everything I needed was, um, it worked every single time and I could, it had very uh, fine control over, uh, over the delays of the two pulses and the, the pulse widths and that sort of thing, which is all very important. I haven't quite gotten into all the details, but it's all very important when it comes to looking at how these things switch. And the kind of key takeaway from my paper, um, which is something that had never been which, which is what really made it novel, was that because of this really fast stimulus, what we were able to do is we were able to um, look at uh, devices of various geometries and start to disentangle what is happening because of the um, uh, uh, because of the device itself and like the geometry of the device itself, and what's happening because of the intrinsic uh, switching of the polarization. And the only way we were able to get to this, uh, only way we were able to understand this, is because we were not, we were no longer really limited only by the uh, by the stimulus time, right? So uh, by going to um, uh, by going to uh, small devices and using the 765, we were able to see switching down in like the single nanoseconds, which was something that had never been seen before, and uh, and allowed us to kind of or new um, understanding of how does the uh, actual geometry of the device and uh, the intrinsic physics of the ferroelectric switching from one state to the other, how do those two kind of interact? Um, and that is like what the kind of novel piece was that we actually were able to get out of, the, uh, out of it. And it, it wouldn't have been possible if we hadn't had like, you know, the fast rise time and, uh, and the ability to um, apply the correct pulse profiles. Um, that's pretty much my slides. I, I obviously want to thank everybody I worked with, um, you know, especially my professor, Professor Ramesh. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm happy to go into more detail. I just kind of want to give a brief overview and, and explain why uh, why the 765 was so essential. It was really, you know, just to summarize, it was really because we wanted to get to very fast stimuli. Um, and uh, without having to go through this huge fabrication process um, and having, and you know, it's just a, literally a plug and play. I can just take it into my lab and plug it in and then I have what I need. Um, and uh, it actually gave us some really, some really cool insight. I'm happy to talk more about the insight or whatever, but um, I, I think that's a, a, a relatively short, quick overview of what, what we did. Does that make sense? It sure does. And that, that's quite amazing actually. And 
Um, and, and just to reiterate, you know, for the 765, you know, it was that fast rise time. It was the, um, you know, polarity, being able to choose between negative and positive, um, and then being able to fine tune the pulse with the delays. And, uh, you know, I'm very, very glad to hear this. And you guys are doing some groundbreaking stuff, you know. Yeah. Uh, 